Hi. So today I got into this Twitter conversation where there were some talk about how to make indexing expressions in Rust nicer to use. And for a while I've been thinking about how we could make Rust feel closer to, let's say, Python. And some of them are workable, some of them are not. Uh, there, there is a lot of space where we could actually improve. Um, but there are some technical reasons why we can't just flip the switch and make it work. If you look at how indexing into a vector works, uh, it requires the implementation of the index trait. And right now, we only have an implementation for u size. Uh, ideally, you would want to, uh, particularly in certain, uh, in certain uh, types of applications, like let's say ga game engines, you are usually operating on i32s or u32s. And doing those transformations between the explicit type and the platform's uh, natural width integer, like u size, is a bit, uh, it's a bit painful. So it's not the end of the world, but it's an ergonomic bump. And Rust has quite a few of those. Now, there are some things that I think we can do to improve that situation. And one of the things that I would really love to be able to borrow is Python's use of negative numbers in the indexing operator to get values from the end of a, a vector, of an array, whatever you want to call it, a, any kind of a container. That is not something that we can do today on Rust. Uh, as I said, we only implement index for u size. If we added an implementation for, let's say, i32 today, uh, that would be a breaking change because it would imply, it would break inference. And in order for that to ever land, we would have to likely change how inference operates to make it more magical uh, when it comes to integers. And that is not something that we want to do, or let's say it's something that is more magical than anything else that we are already doing in the language. And it would be a one-off thing. People wouldn't be able to actually express that in their own code. So it's something that we are we shy away from. We may still do it, but that is not my call to make. And it, if you think that this is something they would really need and you have a good idea of how it should work, uh, you can write an RFC and that would be uh, I would be more than happy to, to see that. But in the meantime, there is one feature in particular that we don't have, which is using an integer literal, a negative integer literal to try to get elements from the end of a vector. And we can't do that. And I could special case things so that the integer literals be, uh, the sugar into a different way and get interpreted by the Rust compiler in a different way so that it actually just works. But that would be a change in the language semantics. Again, it would be magical. It would be a one-off thing. And we probably don't want to do that. We don't want to have things that should work in one place and not in others. But there is nothing stopping me from doing it purely for diagnostics. We already do quite a few weird things. We, we actually evaluate C style formatting strings, for example, if you write, and that is something that the Rust is definitely not part of the language, is something that the Rust compiler doesn't need to do, but something that we can do. So why don't we make the parser actually interpret negative integers? And instead of doing what happens today in the, play, in, in the language, uh, 
where if we have this and we try to do x minus 1, what do we get today? We're going to get the type error. Well, no, we get a trait error. We cannot identify what trait we actually can find. Uh, inference is flowing backwards and identifying that the literal is supposed to be a new size and the neg trait for u size is not implemented, so this doesn't work. But if we are early enough in the parser, we can identify this. It's a literal, it's a negative literal. We already know it's the only th expression used for the indexing. So what if we made the parser support it? Even if though the language doesn't support it, we could not only make this interpreted and give you a better error than this one, we can make the compiler tell you what code you should have written and maybe even make the rest of the code parse and behave as if this actually existed. So I nerd sniped myself into trying this. So, and I thought, OK, this is small enough that I can show my workflow. So let's try it. We have, this is our test case. And we are going to try to make Ted happier just by doing this. So the first thing I'm going to do It's going to do a new file with my test. And yes, I know using Beam inside of VS Code is uh, weird, but uh, let me leave. Uh, I have a local chain. This is my local version of the compiler. I'm going to try to see. So I know where this error is coming from. Uh, if I do a treat if I do this you can see to clearly I need coffee but if I do this I can get the whole trace back of where the error is been actually emitted we can search for this. This actually, I know that I know that this is happening on stashed errors. If we look for this function, you can see we are just iterating over a bunch of errors and eventually emitting them if they are not uh, duplicated. So first we have this the duplication stage. So that we don't actually overwhelm you with a bunch of errors that are necessary, and after that we just emit them one by one. Now, I know this is happening quite later in the in the compiler. So normally, what I would do is try to stay as close to this place as possible. But what I'm going to do is instead modify the parser itself. And that is something that you usually wouldn't want to uh, jump straight in, uh, because there are situations where valid expressions will give you an error afterwards, but the expression itself is valid, and the parser should be continue behaving the same way. But in this case, there is no possible way for the negative number to be valid in this place. So let's try it. Let's look at it. So we have, that's expand. We don't care about expand. We w want to go to the parser. Let's see. So we have parse expression res. With res, parse a sock expression. So parse a sock expression is where we actually want to be looking at. So let's see. We. Uh, check associated operation. 
uh, parse prefix range, parse prefix expression. I think, yep, this is what where we want to look at. And this is one of the main entry points to parsing expressions. And if we look at, there has to be a parse index or parse, uh, let's see, it's going to be called parse. What is it going to be called? So let's look at the expression kinds. These are all the types of things that you can represent inside of a statement. This is going to be something like index, field, index. So a field is something dot field index is what we are looking for. So we want to look for somewhere where we are creating an X kind index. And we're going to have a bunch of these. So I'm going to filter on Rusty parse. So this is make index. Let's look for the call to make index. Make index is parse index expression. So I wasn't that far off. Now, as I'm finding this, I'm realizing that what I said earlier isn't true. This is, these are valid expressions. You can create your own type that is indexable on U size. So we can't quite modify the things in the parser early on and just go on with our lives. Uh, otherwise, we would be this would be a breaking change. We don't want to start erroring on valid code that exists today. So, but what we can do is identify things in the parser that could potentially be an error, that could potentially be a problem, and stash them in our global context. In the, in the compiler's global context. And once we emit an error, check that for that. And if we identify, the, if we find in that hash map that we, potentially a hash map uh, where we keep that metadata, we can give a better error instead of the default error. So that's likely what we're gonna do. So we have parse expression, and here we have, we're going to have a literal expression. So we could just modify this. If we look at index kind, we could do something like this, where index kind is um, kind index. And let's say the parser itself has a, a a suspicious index, uh, push, and we could have the index.span. We could use just the span as a way um, of working on this. So we could do something like this. Uh, we actually would look at, so if we look at the index, the left e would be the foo, the right would be the actual literal, so we would want to look at this. So x if x dot kind if matches x dot kind is the x kind lit. So we could write something like this. This would actually already identify something. We don't want just the literal. We would want, uh, let's see, we would want to look that's let, not lit. Inside of the lit, we would want, uh, so it would be st lit. It 
would be lead kind int we don't care about the width but we do care it would so it wouldn't be an int what it would be would it would be a neg maybe it would be an unop so this is already get, getting quite big right so this wouldn't be a let it would be an ast expert kind unop Unary and the so the UNOP it would be ASD UNOP. Neg. and then the expression so it would be st so we can't do this because of this container type the p we can't really do it on one match so this would look something more closer to this we would have to match kind And for reference, uh, this is what we do a lot. This kind, this kind of uh, checks are done all over the place in the compiler. So, so we do that. Okay. Missing. Uh, as you can tell, this is not something I really prepared for, but it shows off how I usually think about these things. So I only care that it is an integer literal. So this should be close to what I would want at the end. And why is it complaining? I have much lit kind uh, expected fat arrow, but they have fat arrow. Am I missing something? What am I missing? Have something that they haven't closed, and I'm not sure what it is. That is closed. That is closed. That's why. Okay. That error could be better. Okay, so this is not what we want. So we could have something like this. This is not ideal. Now. We can look closer at where this select obligation, type inference fallback, select obligations were possible. This is where the actual inference is happening. So we could do something closer to the source, as I was mentioning way earlier. And I have no idea how long I've been rambling for. But let's look at type inference fallback to get an idea of what we can do. Select obligations. So where are we calling type inference fallback? We're calling it here. And this is type 
with fallback we can do what can we do we know that this has been called somewhere where in type check const r type check and type check with fallback so it's probably one of these Okay, diagnostic only type check. Um, so this is happening, let's see. So we know this is happening somewhere in type check. So let's try a big hammer and emit all of the write down everything that we're trying all of the debug statements that we have in type check so let's look for neg okay so we have predicate neg type inference fallback do we see it anywhere else we have apply adjustments in the impl so that's this is among other things an entire body of the function uh, let's see if there is somewhere close we can look at coercion try course inner apply adjustments this looks fairly close so it looks at that it's on the impl rs file in when we are trying to do the coercion of we're trying to do the coercion of the literal to some type and at that point we already know it's some kind of integer but we don't know what type uh, when you see underscores that means that the compiler has a bunch of hasn't decided what type is going to be and when you see integer it knows that it was an integer literal, it just doesn't know what type of integer. If the compiler didn't do that, then if you just wrote 42 in an index, uh, it would either have to assume its u size every, all, every time, or uh, which would give you errors when you call it in or somewhere that an i32 is expected, or uh, you would have to always ex be explicit about the type, which wouldn't be nearly as ergonomic as it is. So we have register predicate on the slicing operation, lookup look up in trade adjusted, matching method, lookup in trade, m name, lookup method in trade, try index state. So this is interesting. Let's see. So this function is part of resolution. This is when we are looking for a. So if you have foo dot bar, and uh, and parentheses, this is the method that gets called to find bar, on the binding foo that you have available. And it has a bunch of operations that it performs, trying to look for it, multiple error ex exits. Uh, it has to register. Uh, all of the trade bounds that that method and it's the method straight may have. So all of this code is used just to find the right callee. And this is getting called because the indexing operator gets the sugared into just a method call. Now, I may be able to find the indexing operation with this. So these are just mathematical operations, well, uh, all of the binary operations that that we may have. We want to look for unary operations for not, and it's not quite what we're looking for. Place up, 
what is this? Try overloaded place operation. Try to resolve an overloaded place operation. We only deal with the immutable variant here. The ref are index. So this is where index operations get called. So if I look at the output I have here, we have the try overlay place operation at 3.5.3.11, which we can see on the test file that, uh, what was the Spanish it said? 3.5. So 3.5.3.11. Okay. So that makes sense. So this is what's happening. It's looking for whether it's deref or index. So if it's an index operation and we have the arguments, this slice would have only one element for the for this type. So here is a good place where we could add the eager check. So what can we do here? So we have all of this logic here for the ASD expression. We don't need all of that now because we have our disease. So if it's an index, could eagerly do this here and do, we know that there is an argument, so let the x is at is zero. We know that that is there. There is a check over here that that is the case. Right now, we're not going to care for that. And this is a tie. Is it what type of tie? We have multiple, because we have multiple stages in the compiler, we have different types representing Rust source code with similar names. In this case, this is the actual type system type. So this is, we know what type this is. So what I can do here is do this. I'm going to add this. And because I know that I have This is what I actually care about. And I have the base tie already. So let's give this a second to save. And I'm going to build Rust C again. And it's complaining because I have a bunch of garbage in the parser now that we don't need for now. I'm going to keep it just in case. But And this is our Come on, let's save. OK, let's save. I'm using SSH from a very slow connection, so this is taking a while. Uh, OK. Now it's building. Now is a good moment to get some tea. Actually, I'm going to go get some tea. whole experience.
once this has built, we're going to rerun the same command we had earlier, only now with our added info statement to see what the actual types are. Uh, I think that by now I should be able to see to see exactly what we're dealing with. We may need the actual expression to identify that this is uh, a negated value. Um, we can look at that by looking at, if we have access to that, by looking at where we are calling that. So this is being called here, try index step. This method is like, yep. So this method is likely a better place to do this because we have access to the actual expression. So base expression as shown here is the binding that you have that you're indexing on and you care about the index expression which we don't have here, but we have access to the expression, and I'm guessing that the expression itself is the whole thing. So we can extract it from there. We can also look where this is being called to get edx tie. So yeah, so clearly we are not we are losing the indexing expression early on because we, did, we did, didn't need it for anything else. Here we have it. But we have the whole expression, so we can extract it instead of adding an argument. Now, I will likely just add an argument for this. So this that's the test suite that was running. I'm going to run the same command as earlier. Look for info. OK, it's an inference type. Is what about what I expected. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change all of this to also pass in the indexing expression. Okay, let's try index expression. That's where it was. Okay. So I have everything I wanted. So this is where I change things. Now I want to get, leave this as it was. And now we can look at this. So now I have both the type and the expression. And I only want to do this for certain types that I know for a fact don't accept any negative numbers. And things that are in the standard library are a good, are a good bet. I'm not going to go out uh, and make this work for the general case, which is you define your own vector type or your own container type that accepts all, let's say, uh, unsized, uh, all i32s as indexing values. Uh, that's not going to work for you. But for anybody who is using this language's container types, this is going to help them. So. What is this? Why is it trying this twice? What is returning? OK, it's returning there. And we only unsize. Oh, OK. So this unsize is not about the type, is whether the resulting expression is going to be sized value or not. And this is for things like uh, foo the for expressions like this, in some cases, uh, they can be unsized. So writing this expression is valid. If we then do uh, this second iteration of a test, uh, these two different types of operations uh, with this check, 
this expression wouldn't be possible. So what are we going to do? What I'm going to do, first and foremost, if I want the base expression type. So what do we have when we look success, the expression? We have the expression. Let's copy this to So that's the whole expression. This is the base expression, the adjusted type, and the index type. So the adjusted type by now already knows that this vector. So let's see if adjusted type kind. I'm seeing this is quite long, uh, and if you've stayed so far, uh, I hope you, I hope you at least had some cookies to go along with this, or that you're also looking at something more riveting, like paint drying. So, type kind. I'm gonna try to get the types uh, the FID. So if it's an ADT or if it's an array or a slice, because that, those only ha can use uh, use size. So we're going to match on the adjusted types kind. And we're going to look at type kind ADT. That's one. We're going to have a default. We're going to do tie slice. So there is one thing. So you know you can see that this is an enum tie kind. Stylistically, we uh, we re-export every variant of that uh, of that enum at the base of the tie module. Uh, and if I write this and try to compile, we have an internal lint that will complain. So just one thing for you to know. So we have the type, we have array, slice, and potentially string. Array, slice, and string. Slice and string. So these are the things that we are going to want to check. For the ADT kind, because we want to support, we want to special case vector. We, there is another type, ADT def, which I don't recall the structure, but we're going to see soon enough. ADT def has a def ID. Great. The def ID is the unique. Uh, identifier for every type that the compiler sees. So VEC has a different def ID than HashMap. So we're going to take that. And if def ID uh, So there is this. We re-export this type and VEC. Is VEC a def ID? Actually. Let's look at the definition of vector first before I go down the wrong path. And it doesn't have before the comment or after the comment. So it's not a lang, lang item, but it is a Rust diagnostic item. So we can do that. So. So we have a method that we have an attribute that we can use, and we can 
use self dcx this function method rather uh, uh, what did we call it that type to check whether any given def, def id is any type the compiler knows about. So we have two types. We have diagnost Rusty diagnostic items, and we have lang items, which serve the same function, but Rusty diagnostic items are not promoting the type in the language's um, semantics. So VEC continues being just a regular struct that you can use. It's part of the standard library, but it's not part of the language itself. Uh, but this annotation lets us, in the compiler, query for it and give different errors if we encounter a vector. Now, mm, look warm. If these two things happen, we can do something special. Oh yeah, it's going to let Uh, let's see. So we're going to do uh, so edx expert span error we're probably going to have very similar things. So we know that this is a vector. We want to verify that edx expert uh, that kind is a here expert kind. I'm guessing it's unary. So you're going to see that I have here expert kind, and before we had AST expert kind. So the AST is built immediately after parsing. The here is built from the AST, and it serves almost the same thing, but it's the sugared version that has had some passes already. Uh, so we simplify things like an if else expression, it gets turned into a match expression. Um, and not only that, it also has the uh, node ID or the expression ID, and that expression ID is tied to every type. So re every part of the AST, once it gets cooked into, a into the here, uh, it is uniquely identified, and as the type checker is going, it will assign each one of those nodes a type. So uh, this is why we have a here expert ID. I'm checking the documentation, it's a unop with another expression, and because the here is a bit saner, we can match directly. So we want to do here unop neg, I think. Yes, uh, and here expert kind here Vector kind literal. I'm going to assume. Let's clean this up a little bit. Brass format is going to deal with this later, but at least I want it to fit in the screen while we're working on it. It's not literal, it's probably lit. Yep. And I want to assert that it is a uh, that it is uh, first of all spanned span is it node span is just a wrapper type that adds the span field and the inter the element spans is what we call the region in the code that we show. So whenever you see an underline in an error, that is coming from a span. Great. 
great. Now you can see what it looks like to work with really, really bad, yeah, so no, really bad internet connection. So we want the lit node. We don't care about the span. Lit kind. This is going to be an hour long, isn't it? I'm really, really sorry if you're sticking up with this. Mm, call T. So lead kind, what kind of lead kind we have? What is the lead kind? Okay, so lead kind integer. We can do, uh, that will do, that will do. It will do, big, it will do. So this is a close enough, yeah. Yeah, th this looks about right. Okay. After all of that exciting rumbling, we're going to try to build this. Okay. Uh, lead kind is not in the here because it's part of the ST. Okay, Take, oh, I erased the output, so it's gonna, let's look at this. ADT is module, is, the module is private, ADT def doesn't have the fight, what? Oh, probably because, mm, I'm gonna check that. So, probably has two types, these two are gonna work the same. Um, and I'm gonna look first at AST. So I'm guessing I don't have the AST, so. <sighs> I'm probably gonna have to add AST as a dependency of type check. That's gonna be fun. Uh, and ADT def. Am I using it anywhere? No. Is it re-exported? We'll find out. No, I didn't want to re-import you as here. So why does ADT def not have I thought it had an ID, ID, ID. It's called the ID. Standards, who needs them? Yep. Yes, yes. Okay, that. Come on, I saved you already. Um, if you're wondering, ah, uh, yes, tie is not being used. Of course, it's not being. Format this entire file. Don't care about that. Okay, yes, plus format modified it. Okay, this doesn't look too savvy. So once we get to this, we know for sure that at this the library team has changed anything and um, this is gonna if we fail here 
and return uh, and it probably has yes we have to return either none or we could return some and tie error tie error we could do that that would actually be preferable uh, but we know that today rust will not will error out with this so we can just do this and call it a day and that what that will do is if tomorrow somebody modifies vec for this to for multiple integer types to work during indexing we will have to come back and modify this uh, until we did that rust would effectively continue rejecting that code even though it suddenly can because inference or something else in the compiler has been changed. Uh, but for now, uh, this is reasonable. And the good thing about this is instead of getting the generic E0277 error of we couldn't find this trait for this type that actually uh, fit in this expression, you get, you can, well, now you would get just error. Uh, but you can get something like this. And you're getting both errors because I wasn't returning, but you don't need both errors. You can just give one. So now let's clean this up. I think we are actually we're going to do it in an hour. Uh, okay, so we have the actual error. We have found the exact case that we cared about. This is always going to fail. Negative integers cannot be used for indexing. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to create a closure. Because this is going to happen multiple times. So we have the type, we have the span, uh, we're going to call it here, here rather, negative index, uh, negative index, uh, edx expert span, and the out of the ref span, yeah. That's just a t. E dot let t equals self dot tcx um, There is a method that lets us um, if that lets us try to resolve more of the type if it's possible, if we have enough context, to try to remove those underscores and actually give an actual type. Uh, that is very useful, resolve bars if possible. Um, and just the tie, that is good practice if you are having, um, if you're showing things to the user, because the underscore doesn't really tell them much. And in some cases, it can be just more confusing than anything else. So what, let's do this for now. Uh -huh. And actually, I don't even need to do that here. We don't even need to pass it in because it's actually always the same type. So we have that. And we're going to give some suggestions. Um, actually, now that I think about it, the span is the same one as well. So. We just need to call it. Uh, 
uh, yeah, we don't care about the type. We don't care about the type. And because we don't care about the type, okay, that fits all in one. Great. So we have that. Negative integer is going to be used to index on. Uh, huh? And now we have this error. This would be enough. Edx uh, expr that span cannot use a negative integer for indexing on so this would be enough to call it a day. So I'm gonna just do nfmt. Oh, I'm not I'm not actually given some and I can index type and element type. So for an index type I want to return self.tcx.types.r if that is correct. Uh, tcx types r is that it? I know this, there is an error type, but is it that one? Or do we have to create a new error? Come on, there is a tie error. So, silv dcx. Okay. And for the element type, let's go ahead and also return error. And what this type has, the, pro the special property that this type has is that it will silence any subsequent errors. So if you had, yeah, let's have a write. Uh, if you had, um, another expression, let's say an addition, and this would have ended up being um, two option types, an addition cannot be done in option types, then that would be another error that will show up. But we don't want to show those knockdown errors, because maybe once you fix this error, the other one will get fixed. So we should propagate that poison pill so that we should silence everything else that could come after. So. I think that's all we need to call this done in just under an hour. And with me rumbling. <laughs> so error span if I don't if I don't ever if you never assign a variable a, a binding does it make a sound? Yeah, overwrite, I know, it's not formatted, I don't care. Uh, let's see. <sighs> Typos, we, have, we love them. Because it's not in TCX, it's lightly here, yep. And I know because all of a sudden, custom likes are figured out what the type was. Okay, so this is going to be running. I'm going to invoke format again. I'm going to close that. And I'm going to close this so that I can reload it with the 
formative code, this looks formative. Yeah, I guess so. And as soon as that build is done, we are going to be able to see what we wanted. But we're not going to stop here. Oh, no. We're going to try to actually provide a suggestion. If you come from Python, or I think quite a few other languages, you would expect this to work. And it doesn't. It's annoying. And Rust isn't actually telling you how to what you would want to actually use. But what if we do actually uh, would it be a multi part suggestion? Yeah, it will be a multi part suggestion. So let's do this. We're gonna give we're gonna look at what this looks like today. So This is what it looks like now. Pretty good, I would say. Uh, this is what it looks like in the current compiler. Not terrible. Eh, not great either. I'm not okay with that. Hence the last hour of Saturday afternoon fun. What if you go the extra mile? Let's try to actually tell the user uh, what they likely wanted to do. To access an element starting from the end of the vector, Actually, I think we can use this, and it will work. I hope it does. Um, and if it doesn't, well, we know the fix. So if you want uh, that, you can Sometimes actually figuring out how to write the description is takes more time than the actual code itself. Okay. Three arguments, one given. So multi part suggestion. Let me do this and applicability machine applicability. So this takes a vector of, of tuples with a span for a piece of code and the resulting code. So what we want to do, we want to go from code that looks like foo bar to code that looks like foo dot len minus one. So well, we may not even need the multipart suggestion. We can just do a span suggestion reverse. We have that. We have the span. The span is gonna be edx expert span to low, this creates a new span that covers the space right between the opening square bracket and the minus. So spans actually don't point at a character, it points at the space between two characters. So this is creating a zero width span that points between the opening uh, square bracket and the minus and or dash and that lets us oh the span goes first right and I want to suggest the ch -ch 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 
the second expression, but here we find the problem. Foo doesn't need to be a binding. It could be an arbitrary expression, and we don't want to suggest writing this, because that would be bad. So what we want to do is only provide the suggestion if the base expression dot kind is here export kind it would be binding let's see well it's not binding because the highlighting is telling me that it couldn't identify it but let if block assign field index path uh, return struct repeat yield what is just finding uh, let's see drop temps maybe we'll have something like that but uh, method call call box array const block okay I don't know but we can figure out because we have the base expression here. So, base expression kind path, yes. So we want the path. So this will, if we do it only for path, uh, that will be fine but we don't want it only for path, we would want it for something like full bar as well, that would be suggesting would be valid. Uh, that's probably making the, the video already way too long. We can do that as a follow-up PR, or as part of this PR, but just not annoy the hell out of you. Uh, so what we're going to do is of this uh, export to string uh, pp rust yes so pp rust export to string base expert I'm using this instead of getting the snippet simply because I know this is a path I, it's going to reformat it correctly. I don't know if people rust has been, I know it hasn't been imported, so. So what's, what is the actual import? Where is, does that live? People rust com is coming from pretty rust. And is rusty here? Pretty as pp rust. Okay. this come on we are ready to run the test okay okay um the first one was applicability yes i'm pretty sure that's gone from spam, but Rusty errors, Rusty errors, I don't see Rusty errors, so this is a GE. So applicability is used, so every suggestion 
has an applicability, it's marked with an applicability, and this is telling RustFix and the Rust Analyzer whether this is something that they can just go ahead and change, if it's something that the, it needs user input, like has placeholders, or if it's something that we don't know, uh, which is, I think is called unknown. And with that is just a signal on the level of confidence we have on the suggestion. So we have that, and for PP Rust, uh, and path. Is there an... I always forget how to print print node now. Print item. Do we have expression? Print expression. Print the expert. And we need to make a whole thing for this. Print create. You know what? I'm gonna go ahead with the snippet version. Cx <sighs> dot here dot um, anymore. This is so slow, this is so slow, and I want to fix the tuple. The span to snippet is not found. Is anything here? She's in, it's in session. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Pretty sure I had a suggestion flight for just borrowing that. Oh well. I would get up and get more tea, but uh, if this was cold, the pot is probably frozen. <sighs> oh, this is a long waste of time for everybody involved. I hope you got something out of it and that you had the foresight to watch at the watch this at 1.5 speed. And I'm not gonna shut stop the recording until we'll see the final result. But the next thing is going to be creating the PR, and hopefully, somebody is going to review it soonish. Uh, this, so this is roughly my workflow. This is usually what it looks like for me to make a change to a compiler error. Uh, the amount of time sounds about right for something this small. And yeah, if you. So if you got lost, don't worry. I've been doing this for years. It's and as you could see, I got lost in some things. Uh, and it doesn't have to be. What? What? Did I just? What the hell? Ah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that would be a nice improvement. Finding couldn't read fifteen at the rest. You have F fifteen. Um 
Okay, there you go. Lovely. I'm gonna go create the PR right now. Uh, as I said, this is medium involvement. I got lost with a few things. I know where to, f I have some memory about some specific things, but as you can see, I had to look up some, uh, some specifics. Uh, I'm not using go to definition simply because I'm on a very slow SSH connection. So rationalize the, the round trip of rationalizer is actually slower than just grabbing the entire code base. But other than some hic minor hiccups, this is roughly what working Rusty purely for diagnostics looks like. I hope someone found this interesting and worst case scenario, nobody saw this, and, but we have a new diagnostic. See you.